Islam has taught that men and women should not intermingle socially. Separation of the genders was established during the time of the Holy Prophet ﷺ as an Islamic practice. Men and women had separate sections for prayers. However, this segregation was not only for the prayers itself, but for after the prayers as well. Hazrat Umm Salama anha, a wife of the Holy Prophet ﷺ narrates that whenever Allah's Messenger ﷺ finished his prayers with Taslim, the women would get up and he would stay on for a while in his place before getting up. This is in Sahih Bukhari. After the prayers, men would socialize with one another. If men and women were permitted to intermingle socially, then the women would have socialized with the men after the prayer in the same way that the men socialized with one another after the prayers. There was no reason for the companions of the Holy Prophet ﷺ to change their behavior once they left the presence of the Prophet ﷺ, or once they left the masjid, as the hypocrites would do. Hazrat Umm Salama anha, wife of the Prophet ﷺ, said that when the Messenger of Allah gave the salutation, he stayed for a while. By this, people thought that women should return earlier than men. So respect for separation of the genders was established under the direct supervision of the Holy Prophet ﷺ. In fact, not only did the Prophet ﷺ establish this teaching in social gatherings, but he taught separation of the genders in non-social situations wherever it was possible. Concerning one of the entrances of his masjid, Hazrat Ibn Umar narrates that the Prophet ﷺ said that if we reserve this door for women, it would be better. It is narrated that Nafi said that Ibn Umar did not enter through it, through this door, till the time that he passed away. Also, once when the Holy Prophet ﷺ was coming out of the masjid and men and women were mingled in the road, he said to the women that draw back for you must not walk in the middle of the road, keep to the sides of the road. It's narrated that then women were keeping so close to the wall that their garments were rubbing against it. Now, some people object to Islam's teaching on separation of genders in social gatherings, saying that it is oppressive to segregate women and men. However, Western society itself imposes segregation of the genders in various places based on morality. For example, we segregate locker rooms by gender. If the possibility of sexual harassment is a concern, then those who identify as lesbian or gay should have been banned from the bathrooms of their gender and required to use the bathroom of the opposite gender. And we would have to give those who are bisexual private stalls. There's no logical reason why we separate locker rooms by gender other than the principle of modesty. A man who believes in unisex locker rooms could demand the right to use women's locker rooms on the principle that segregation of the genders is oppressive. What response then would those people who object to Islam's ideal on separation of genders give to this man that does not contradict their own principles? So both Western society and Islam encourage separation of genders out of respect for modesty. There's only a difference in degree in that Islam promotes more modesty. The purpose of having a separation of genders in Islam is to prevent social interaction between genders and its harms. Explaining how this applies equally to both men and women, Hazrat Khalifat al-Masih al-Khamis Sayyidullah said that unrestricted freedom of sexes in forming relationships is causing many of the perversions in society. And we have to strive in safeguarding ourselves from this. It is also evident from this that if women are not permitted to swim with men, then men are also not permitted to swim with women. Therefore, the restrictions do not apply only to women, but also to men. This is a guidance of Hazur. The idea of being just friends with someone of the opposite gender is what leads many people in society to promiscuity without their even realizing it. In an ideal Islamic society, in places where interaction between the genders is primarily professional, like the market, segregation of the genders is not required. However, in places where interaction between the genders would generally be social, the genders have separate sections. If we start socializing between genders, whether at Jamaat events or elsewhere, it would defeat the very purpose of why we go through the trouble of making separate men's and women's sections in the first place. These principles apply to social media as well. Huzura Yadawallah said, we should not chat with non-relatives on Facebook or through any other means. Huzur Ayyadullah has addressed the issue of male and female interaction many times. To summarize his answer, he has stated that professional interaction is permissible when necessary, but social interaction is not. Huzur said that in our professional interactions with someone of the opposite gender, they being an Ahmadi or non Ahmadi is irrelevant. Our interaction is to be concerning our work and should not extend to socialization. Huzur also said that we should think of students as students who we interact with, not as anything beyond that. 
Although sometimes people do find matches based on professional contact, the guiding principle is that each interaction with the opposite gender, in all those interactions, our intention should have a professional purpose, not social. When the Holy Prophet وسلم, and Hazrat Khadija anha, met, they met with professional purposes. If an Ahmadi professionally or academically interacts with an Ahmadi of the opposite gender with the ulterior motive of courtship, it would be unprofessional and unethical even by secular standards. So our deeds are judged by our motives. This same principle applies in tabligh to the opposite gender. Addressing Lajna Huzura Yadawullah said that speaking of tabligh, I want to mention that girls and women should only do tabligh to other women and girls. Tabligh should be to one's own gender. Girls should do tabligh to girls and boys should do tabligh to boys. This same principle applies to social media. Huzuri said that girls should make tabligh contacts with other girls. Some people have tabligh contacts through the internet. The bleak contacts through the internet should also only be with women. Let the work of doing the bleak to men remain the responsibility of men. So this guidance of Huzur applies, as Huzur said, to both men and women. One way to define appropriate interaction in tabligh is with the examples of the media department. The purpose of the media department is to introduce Ahmadiyya to as many people as possible. When someone takes an interest, then they direct them to the tabligh department because this job of the media department is only to introduce the message of Islam. It is fine for us to introduce Islam to people of the opposite gender. However, when someone takes deeper interest in Islam, they should be referred to the gender-appropriate auxiliary. If we keep these principles in mind, and are honest with ourselves, we can find the answer to many of these questions in our own hearts. Remember, the purpose of these directives is for our good and the good of our children, and to avoid even taking one wrong step towards the promiscuity that this society has fallen into.